I'm Jack Otter. Uh, I wear a number of hats at Barron's, but the important one for today is editor of the special section in today's Wall Street Journal, which has a cover story written by Adam Cecil, who's on the end here, uh, with an interesting thesis that we will be getting into. Adam is the chief cook, bottle washer, and founder of Gravity Partners, the best little fund you've never heard of. Uh, he has handily beaten the market since inception, largely through downside protection. Uh, and you have heard of uh, your company, uh, Emilio Ciccone works at Double Line, where he runs the strategy behind a value-focused, actively managed ETF, ticker symbol DBLV. Correct. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so for those of you who have not read the journal yet this morning, I wanted to have Adam start off by stating the thesis behind his story, and then we'll jump right in. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I am a, an old-school uh, value-based equity manager, and uh, I was raised uh, at Sanford Bernstein, which those of you may know is a deep value shop, and we and many others made a living by uh, buying temporarily depressed industries and stocks you know, uh, if healthcare was trading at eight times and traditionally it traded at 12 times, or autos, the same thing, or retail, then you would buy them because they would, you know, go back to normal. And conversely, if tech was trading at 18 times and the normal multiple was 15 times, you would sell that. So you would, you would buy the cheap stuff and you would sell the expensive stuff. Fast forward 25 years later and the world has changed quite a bit. And my, the thesis is basically, you know, thanks to uh, you know, computing power, uh, uh, wireless technologies, digi digital technologies, many of these traditional industries, vast swaths of the American economy uh, are challenged uh, by these uh, new uh, technological developments. And it's no longer an investable strategy for much of the market. There are exceptions, but in general, Buying stuff because it's cheap is not, will not n always reward you because many of those sectors just aren't coming back. And you even put a number on, at least T. Rowe Price has, something like 30% of the economy has been disrupted and that number's going up. Yeah, I interviewed a T. Rowe Price mutual fund manager who has a very good long-term record. And he, he and his team every year um, uh, study the, um, the S&P 500. And each, each one of the 500 companies they put in a bucket at risk of uh, secular disruption or not at risk. And when he started five years ago, it was 20% of the market cap of the S&P. Now it's 30%, and he says in a couple of years it could be 40 to 50. Emilio, you're seeing similar uh, movement in the market? I am, indeed. And uh, like Adam, I'm a value investor who also has to come to grips with this unique period of time that we are in, in the economy. Uh, the way I like to put it is we're seeing elevated levels of creative destruction. And so the theme of investing in the disruptors and avoiding the disrupted is obviously uh, a valuable strategy. Um, and so our investment uh, philosophy that informs our stock picking, we refer to as fundamental value. And uh, by that, I mean we are willing to invest in classic value companies, and we believe in buying when price is less than intrinsic value. We don't believe that's changed. Um, but we also recognize that in order to appreciate the dynamics that Adam just talked about, one needs to look under the hood and understand the fundamentals of those companies. And you can also find intrinsic value in companies that have these very long secular growth paths in front of them and elevated barriers to entry. I agree that that exists largely in tech, and it's not just tech, because old tech tended to be cyclical and it was difficult to know when you were going to be disrupted by the next version. What's unique about today's tech is that they're platform companies, they're software-based, they have higher growth, and they're asset light. And so that means that the growth paths, the returns, and the competitive advantage period is longer. And these are sequoias, and we're expecting them only to grow to the size of oak trees. And so there's a risk, which is unusual in the market, that people actually underestimate the size of these companies. So I completely agree with him on that point. Very unusual for analysts to uh, underestimate something. Let's, let's, let's speed up on a few companies. Adam, uh, give me a company, give me a sector that just isn't coming back. Well, you don't want to over-dramatize it because there are sectors of the economy that are still stable, like industrials, for example. Light fixtures, elevator, pumps, industrial stuff, that's not going away. Um, on the other hand, there are bifurcated sectors, you know, uh, Amazon has uh, been at it for 25 years, 
and has 5% share of U.S. retail commerce. 5%. So where is that going? Is that re reverting back to normal? What's normal? So you, retail, obviously, at risk. The other ones that people are a little less aware of is energy. You know, fossil fuel companies are at risk because uh, wire, I mean, uh, wind and solar are coming down the cost curve and becoming much more competitive. Um, and then I would argue that financials are, are at risk because they have been serial abusers of their customers because they could, because there were high barriers to entry with uh, you know, regulatory barriers and capital barriers, and those are now coming down with technology. And uh, I think financials, a big part of financials are at risk. So, Emilio, rather than jump on that train, let's just move on to what are the new value stocks? <laughs> so, the companies that I uh, just described uh, that are asset light, that have barriers to entry because of things like network effects, those are the companies that we think uh, can grow and see uh, further appreciation, depending on the macro environment, going forward, notwithstanding high multiples and of course, Amazon would be a company like that. We saw Warren Buffett buy it. Some people would say in late innings, we own that. Um, and other names uh, would be PayPal. That's a best-in-class payment, has similar characteristics. Google's another one, or I should say Alphabet. So those are the types of names that we're willing to put in a portfolio alongside more classic value opportunities. Adam, yeah, I would just ahead. agree with the media and, and what he said earlier is very true. It, it's not just tech that uh, is going to kind of grow to the sky. Now, there are other sectors that are secularly advantaged. Aerospace, for example, has grown twice GDP for the last 50 years, and yet 80% of the world has yet to set foot on a plane. Now, that's a growth trajectory that we like. And then there are just one-offs that, um, like I own Sherwin-Williams. Paint is never going to go obsolete, and they have a competitive advantage through their dealer network. Uh, I own the credit bureaus, Equifax and TransUnion. There are only three credit bureaus. And they're an essential link in the uh, consumer economy. So you have to be granular and careful in your analysis and not paint with too broad a brush, either on the negative or the positive side. Now, the warning that this time is different are the four most dangerous words has become a total cliche, but it's also some truth to it. Um, I, I remember watching uh, Fidelity post Peter Lynch, and every time they fired the managers and brought in new ones, whatever strategy the old ones had been pursuing clicked in and would have worked had they just played the course. So, you know, the, uh, some, someone said to me, oh, Adam's story appearing in the journal today, that marks the bottom. These, these, these stocks are going to start to come back. So push back against me on that. Why is it really different this time? Well, as I said earlier, Amazon has 5% share of U.S. retail commerce. So as Emidio rightly said, pe people always underestimate good companies. They think they're going to grow to be Oaks and they're going to grow to be Sequoias. I mean, what part of U.S. retail commerce is Amazon going to end up at? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Not five. Al right. Alphabet has a minority of, uh, uh, you know, digital advertising has probably 30% market share worldwide. Where's that going? You know, uh, so, um, you know, I always remember mentally, I walk around, I don't know if people have seen the photograph of, um, in 1900, the Easter Day Parade down Fifth Avenue, New York, there was a hundred horse-drawn carriages and one automobile. And then side by side, there's a picture in 1913, a half a generation later, and there are 99 automobiles and one horse. Uh, I think that's kind of where we are. Uh, now, of course, investing in automobile companies at that time was a real long shot. Uh, three of those companies still survived, and, and 97 went out of business, or 96 went out of business. Yeah. Um, so is this different now in the sense that the leaders are actually a much smaller group? Well, uh, Emilio had talked about platform companies, so it's very, I would say that General Motors is already established yeah. its alphabet. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but the platform, it, it's, you know, it's over. The consolidation yep. is over in many of these important industries. I don't right. know if you agree. I, I agree that uh, platforms are forming and the game is over even for the newest ones and that's why the multiples are high and they will perform well for a long period of time. Of course, the real question as investors is what's priced in and what those multiples look like and how you get comfortable with those. Um, I guess I would say two comments about the question, uh, are we falling into the trap of it's different this time? One, I don't believe that it is the first time that we've seen this level of disruption. I think things that are very rare, uh, you have to look back farther in history, and unfortunately in this case, you'd have to look back so far to see analogs to something like Amazon that no one is alive today that would have been investing in those companies. I'm thinking of Standard Oil, 
and the disruption that happened with the invention of railroads and fossil fuels. Um, I think we're seeing that order of change, and so it's punctuated equilibrium, and we're in the odd period of punctuation, accelerated growth and innovation that's different, but we've seen it before, and we know that those companies, while they became very large and there were multi-decade growth paths attached to them, they're now the cyclical companies that are being disrupted in a lot of areas. So we have to be mindful of that. Uh, the second thing I would say is that we do need to pay attention to multiples and expectations because the most important thing as a value investor is to recognize the difference between the perceptions of risk in these names and the real risks in them. And we're in a unique situation where the risks might be that we're underestimating the growth rates of some of these companies. But we also might be, in some cases, overestimating the demise and greatly exaggerating the demise of some of the disrupted companies. So we want to keep that in balance as well. I think that's an interesting point because you guys might differ a bit on that. Um, so l let me ask, is there a price at which, and I'll start with Adam, is there a price at which you would buy one of the companies that you really have left for dead, an oil company or a retailer or something like that? Uh, yes. Uh, let me just digress for a minute with what Emidio said. You know, Sears, which is one of the companies that recently went to zero, disrupted by Amazon and other factors, they were actually, to Emidio's point, the great disruptor. And not once, but twice. They were the first big mail order catalog, and they were the first mover. So they were the Amazon of 100 <laughs> years ago. The analog Amazon. And then in the 20s, after World War I, in the roaring 20s, it was a great time of prosperity, they said, oh, you know what? People have automobiles. Let's start, uh, let's start brick and mortar retail stores. Right. Uh, so they've done it twice. So the disruptors become the disrupted, and I, I am 100% sure that uh, you know, in 50 years, 100 years, whatever it is, Google and Amazon will be disrupted. I mean, that's the beauty of market capitalism. To answer your question, though, you know, five times earnings is a good multiple for me, for a, a, a company at risk, because that means you, if they live for five years earning the same amount of mo a money, you're going to get your money back. Sure. Anything more than five times, count me out. Deep value. Uh, yeah. Medio, I think you have a slightly different view of that. Well, I guess the, the disagreement uh, focuses more on some of the dynamics that are driving valuations. So just to take one example, uh, I guess where we might disagree on financials is that I think that a lot of the reasons why the financials are themselves trading at lower valuations has less to do uh, with technological disruption, particularly the largest money centers, and has more to do uh, with the macro environment. Uh, the macro environment over the last 10 or 12 years, because we have attempted to avert a Great Depression by keeping rates extraordinarily low, that's highly disruptive to financial companies in general. And so you're seeing that play out, and you're seeing in the bond markets uh, indications that rates are going to stay low potentially for a while longer uh, before potentially jumping up a lot. Um, and so in that environment, it's very difficult to get excited about financials. And so I think it has more to do with that macro environment, and I think that it's important to take those considerations uh, into account as well, and I think the best investors do that because in the last 10, 12 years, uh, macro factors have disproportionately impacted performance of stocks. Uh, financials <coughs> are an interesting case. Uh, there's another objection to financials that Adam has, and to put it nicely, it's that we don't tend to like those companies very much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, their value, you know, you, as a company, you can either add value or you can extract value. And I bet on the value adders. I, I call my company Gravity Capital because I want to find, because the market will act as a natural force and it will pull down ordinary companies. And most companies are ordinary. I want companies that kind of have escape velocity, that can defy gravity, that have high returns on capital, that can grow above average, that have a competitive barrier so they can keep growing to the well, sky. Well, one could argue that Jamie Dimon and some of these big companies have huge competitive barriers, but you also say, we hate them. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I just bet that in the end, um, you know, the wicked are punished <laughs> by the market, yeah. not by, well, not Elizabeth by some. Elizabeth Warren wants to as well. Huh? Elizabeth Warren wants to as yeah, well. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, w w do you own any banks? You own a fair number of financials, right? We do, yeah. And the reason, we, we're underweight banks currently because okay. of the positioning in the cycle. Um, but what you alluded to earlier, uh, and that's the case for JP Morgan and other banks, is there's tremendous barriers to entry in terms of scale. 
uh, the networks that they have. And also, you have to recognize that the banks themselves are transforming themselves. The largest banks have very large budgets for IT. I've heard estimates 30 to 40 percent of employees at these banks are in some way involved in IT, and they are reinventing themselves. The other thing to consider is it's a highly regulated industry. And um, in the next recession, uh, certainly the government and we investors are going to be a little bit worried about the shadow banking industry and what the vulnerabilities and risks are. We have forced the banks in part because we dislike them, given what happened in the, the financial crash. Uh, we, we've handcuffed them, we've regulated them, and the transparency levels are higher. Uh, so the irony is that when uh, we might hate them the most, and you're hearing that certainly amongst the politicians running for president, uh, they're actually less risky. So the perception of risk to the economy around the banks is higher than the actual risk. Um, but I do think that the advantages that they have in scale and scope uh, will allow them to perform, and in a better interest rate environment, I think you'll see good value rewarded there. To divert briefly, uh, Jeffrey Goodlock, uh, what is his long-term view on those interest rates? Does he think they'll eventually go up? I mean, certainly, we're, we're, we're putting a lot of supply into the market right now. We really are, and it's very, very difficult to predict long-term interest rates. Uh, because uh, the, the Fed has uh, backed away from uh, what we thought were original plans to normalize the balance sheet and bring interest rates back up to normal levels. Um, in an average recession, you need to drop interest rates. Most uh, bond guys will tell you 500 basis points. We don't have the headroom uh, to do that. Right. So that's a problem, and it seems that they've walked away from that as soon as the market started to panic over it. Um, so, you know, I think... The two things that our firm uh, would say is, number one, um, over the next five years, it looks like interest rates are going to stay low. Uh, but after that, uh, rates could go up. And that has to do with the fact that we're printing a lot of deficit and debt. And eventually, that's going to be a problem that's going to force long rates up. So um, those, are, those are the dynamics. The other thing I'd, I'd like to say about macro quickly, because it's important to understand this, if you think about when uh, Microsoft and Oracle were founded, <coughs> excuse me, when they, when they went public, it was 1986. So those companies have been public companies for 33 years. And that entire time, interest rates have generally been, been falling, if you look at the long term, the very long term trend. Um, and so we haven't seen an environment in which rates are going up and these innovative tech companies that have big barriers to entry and uh, are asset light, the kind of companies that we're attracted to and we want to invest in and they've done well to date. We've never seen them perform when you have a secular upturn in rates. Now, obviously, we're not calling that, but I would just ask investors to consider which companies are most vulnerable when the secular trend in rates starts to rise. <clears throat> and those companies, I think, are going to be most vulnerable to multiple pressure. Uh, another way to think <clears throat> about it is uh, those companies <clears throat> have the longest duration of all the equities out there, and so naturally their prices are most vulnerable to rate hikes. That, that's where I would really disagree with Emilio. Uh, you know, a, a good business that grows at above average rate with a defensible moat is going to do well, full stop. Buffett bought Coca-Cola, bought American Express in the 50s. Rates went up, rates went down. People bought more Coke, people bought more, uh, you know, used their credit cards. I think it's the same thing with the Googles and Alphabets. Um, if their businesses outperform, as we think they will, interest rates will be immaterial. I would think higher interest rates would advantage an asset light company that doesn't have big capital expenses. It, it, you know, you, it's why they call the economics a dismal science. <laughs> Who the hell knows? Sure. Is it a good business? Does it have defensible moats? I, you know, yeah. I, right. I just wanted to say that. It's so I don't, I don't think we're disagreeing. I think we're talking about two different things. There, there's mean reversion in the company's earnings and cash flow, and I agree with you 100%. And in fact, those companies that are high quality franchises can raise price and uh, address inflation if we ever see it. So I agree with that. All I'm saying is that there's also mean reversion in expectations which are manifest in the multiples of those names. And so that's the piece that you have to be careful of because that will compress and it will compress disproportionately. Doesn't mean that they can't outgrow that compression, but it's actually very rare mm -hmm. if you look at the long scope uh, and history of 
the stock market that that occurs. Uh, the lights are flashing at us, guys. Uh, we have an old Barron's tradition, which is to ask every single panelist at our conferences to leave the audience with one actionable tip. Real fast, start with Adam. Well, I think Alphabet is one of the world's most misunderstood companies. It runs itself for the long term. It really doesn't care about Wall Street expectations, as we saw a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'm a very long-term investor. I'm a tax-efficient investor. It's a perfect stock for me. It, I can, if people want to call me up, I'll tell you how I can get to how, how the core search business is trading for eight times normalized earnings. Emilio, uh, finish it off. Sure. I, I would just say don't be afraid to ring the cash register. Uh, the returns have been very good in the stock market. I think volatility is going up. Political risks are going up. And so it's time to get a little bit more defensive. Thank you very much, uh, you. Adam Cecil, Emilio Ciccone, and thank you, audience.